instead, we've got at the college something called the Woodhouse Centre, which I'm a part of, and we're there to give students and alumni advice on what they can do in music and encourage them. There are so many different things, because what Leela's doing tonight, that's one destination, but there's so many other people on that stage doing great work as well. And not just performing at the proms as well, or performing in the way that we know it. And there's a lot of outreach work that goes on. Just this afternoon, we had 20 percussionists from the Royal College of Music here in the hall doing the Blue Peter prom. And what they were doing, they were getting the whole auditorium packed with kids to make music for themselves. And obviously, it's going to be a great rush to be in Leela's position and to be able to um, do this glossy communication with all of these people here. But to just help one individual get into music, um, who knows what you're going to stimulate? They might become a musician themselves or something completely different culturally. Who knows? But it's a really great great thing to do. There are so many different, different things to do in music and in, in the Royal College of Music we're really keen to show students the wide range of what they can do. It's a funny one music isn't it because you almost feel like you should kind of burn to do it. Well, what's it like with composers? I just always think you know you don't go to a careers advisor and say do you think I should become a composer do you? I mean a composer is a composer probably from, from birth. I mean maybe that's slightly romantic but you know it burns within people I think to either be a player or a composer. I think that's right. I mean clearly all the composers you know we're, we're listening to tonight have all had that <laughs> that uh, impulse from a very very young age to, to write and compose. And obviously, as a, as a publisher, it's our responsibility to, with the with the composers we do have, to nurture them and to take them through their long career as a, as a composer. We are obviously we do receive many many submissions from composers who wish to seek a publisher, um, but we see it as an incredible responsibility. It's a long-term relationship, and it has to be one where you, you give and take on both sides. That we are providing a supportive role to that composer. They're giving up a lot to us and we have to nurture them through it. What tends to happen is that they will, we'll keep an eye on those composers some, for some time, we'll be, you know, finding out the context of their work, seeing, seeing their works performed and, you know, when the time is right um, and, you know, we then, we then approach them with a formal offer but it's important not to have a large roster of composers and not be able to look after them as individuals. They all have individuals, something special that they have to say, and it's our job to look after them. Are students coming to you, James, and saying, how do I get published? Yeah, yeah. it's very yeah. difficult with composers. It's much more difficult. There's, 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 there's less opportunities. But we encourage them to kind of work with the other students, get the violinists working with the composers, make things happen to themselves. You've got to have an enormous um, sense of enterprise as a young musician these days. Talent on its own is simply not enough. You've got to keep having ideas and also have confidence in yourself. And, and just be prepared to go wrong, ask anybody for advice. Everybody in the music profession is very willing to give advice and, and, and try and make new things happen. Think of what hasn't happened before. So yes, aspire to be on the prom stage and we hope many of our musicians get there. But make music anywhere. Let's get music back in the place where it belongs, all over, all over the, the, the public landscape. I think there are also many places, you know, yes, publishing provides a certain service, um, but there are other, it's great work, for example, um, SPNM, S Society for the yeah. Promotion of New Music, um, uh, British Music Information Centre also has an initiative there where they're supporting young composers who are looking for an opportunity to get their music out beyond their circle, and, and you know, there are, there's a lot of great work, and obviously the, the sort of work, the auto outreach work is also happening on the composer front. Great, thanks both. We'll uh, catch up with you a little bit later on. But let's just find Susie again. She's uh, somewhere in the house and she's got up with tonight's celebrity guest. I have Verity. I've managed to drag myself away from the bar for a change and uh, sneaked into Loader Box 25 where I found the star of stage and screen, Patty Boulay. <laughs> Patty, it's lovely to have you here at the proms. Thank you. Did you enjoy that performance? Oh, that was absolutely I don't see how you couldn't. I know. She was, Layla was so passionate and her right arm must be strong, but she looks so elegant. Don't you just hate her? <laughs> well, I, you, you just... You say that, oh. you're not doing so badly yourself. Singer, oh. actress, oh. stage performer, renaissance woman. <laughs> Tell me what you've been up to recently. Well, I've just actually took me 10 years to write my show Sundance, and I finally got it on stage. We sort of showcased it at the um, Hackney Empire. And God willing, we're hoping to take it to Paris. We were going to come into the West End, but we're taking it to Paris first. Lovely, much more civilised. Go to Paris much first. Much more civilised. The West End can wait. <laughs> Didn't say that. <laughs> So you say it took you 10 years to write. It did. It what took, inspired um, you to write such a big piece to get into such a big project? Oh, there's so many reasons, but the main reason was seeing Riverdance. I went to see Riverdance. Oh, really? oh I, I know, I just liked what Riverdance did for Ireland. You know, the way it changed, because before that we had this perception of uh, River, um, Ireland, it was bombers, okay, terrorists, and then Riverdance came out. If you say to me Riverdance, I went, oh, Ireland, oh, did you see that? You know, it's Positive. so absolutely. And Africa, with us, with HIV and famine and everything else, I just wanted something positive. 
you know, so I wanted to write something that people would look at and think of Africa. And I didn't want to call it African dance or whatever, so I called it Sundance. It's kind of like a very glamorous version of African dance, really. Now, you're using that as a big cultural statement for Africa. Why, what do you think music can give people culturally? Why do you think oh, that's a help? Well, music, it's, uh, it's the international language, isn't it? It's the language of the world, really. I mean, listening to what, the Adagio, for instance, and listening to the um, Hebrides by Mendelssohn, it's just, it transcends all languages, all, you know, I mean, I'm here as an African, and I'm loving that, and it must be, this must be an international, international audience. Mm. There must be so many people from different places, and we're all enjoying the same music without a language barrier. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. <laughs> now, you say as an African woman, you grew up in Nigeria. Yes. Did you have much exposure to music, to classical music, oh, I did. or to a huge range? Well, my father, being a, was a politician, is dead now, and um, Beethoven and Tchaikovsky. That was it, and Benny Goodman. <laughs> oh, interesting. Very eclectic yes, taste, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, and yeah, Benny Goodman. Yeah, and then I grew into James Brown. <laughs> That's an interesting developmental hey. there. <laughs> and then fell around some cootie and it just went downhill from there. <laughs> no, it was, you know, I've had such a mixture of um, musical background. And I just love even Japanese music when I was in Japan and I, I was playing Carmen in Japan. And I loved, I loved the Japanese music. Nobody in the company could understand why. I said, if you want to understand the people, listen to their music. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now I understand that you've performed on stage in this very venue, so it must be Many kind times. of interesting for you to sit here tonight it and watch people really, on the stage. It is wonderful. What's it to like sit as here? a performer? Oh, it's the best place in the world. It is just you just come out. I mean, the last time I was here, I must say, I was so dog tired. So I got here six o'clock in, in the morning. I was actually putting on the show with my idea, and we had Cliff Richard and Gabrielle and Bonnie M and Yuri Geller and the children's choir it was three thousand singers. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It was okay. the place. We just <laughs> lifted the roof. You can That's imagine. A big it gig. was fantastic. We all left. Everyone's dancing down the road even when we left at the end of the day. And it was it was wonderful. It's beautiful. It's a fantastic building. And the you know, they, we came in after they refurbished it. And it just I think we were one of the two first two second act to, to be here after it was refurbished. It's just magnificent, isn't it? Well, it's one of the very few places, I think, where you can see the whites of the audience's eyes. They're that close that to you. <laughs> well, I love that. Yeah. I love seeing the audience. You know, I, I don't like um, studio work. Mm. I like being in front of an audience. Now, when you were growing up in Lagos, did you feel that you had a kind of calling, as always, oh, another God. fabulous feature <laughs> of the films? Um, did you feel you had a calling to be a musician? Was it something you always felt? Oh, we all did. We all sang when we were little. But I got into show business by accident. I actually mistook Shaftesbury Theatre for Madame Tussauds, you know? <laughs> okay. Seriously. That's an I interesting thought, mistake. Well, there was a, it was hair. Yeah. It was a big head of hair. And I was just here as a tourist. And I thought I was going to see Madame Tussauds. And there was a long queue. And I joined the queue and I got the job. <laughs> here I am. Well, it's a fantastic way of making <laughs> show business. So any plans for the future? What's your next big project? Well, Paris uh, with Sundance and then a tour of France. Bring it back to England, maybe a tour of the UK and uh, a tour of the world after that, God willing. Well, big plans, Patty. Absolutely. It's lovely to see you here at the proms. Thank Thanks you. ever so much for talking Thank to me. Thank you very much. Back to you, Verity. Thank you, Susie. Well, joining me here now in the box, along with James Murphy, is Andrew Herbert. We're going to be hearing uh, Vaughan Williams' Sea Symphony. And, Andrew, something of a specialist. What made you want to specialise in Vaughan Williams' music, Andrew? Well, I think two reasons. One, the man himself. He was a fascinating character. One of his contemporaries described him as uh, intellectually aristocratic and biologically democratic. And I wanted to find out more about what, what this was about. And also the music, of course, with its directness, its honesty, and yet the mystical, meditative vein which runs through it. And, and also an optimism, I think, in, in much of his music. Certainly an optimism in the Sea Symphony, isn't there, that we're going to hear tonight. This is his first symphony. James, is, it, is he a composer that you're drawn to too? Yeah, well, I mean, if I said that the brook was the roast beef, this is the <laughs> beef. This is absolutely an extraordinary piece, it, right from the off. Um, and whereas um, uh, Wagner said that the Mendelssohn um, was a masterpiece by a landscape painter, this isn't a painting of the sea. We're at sea in this one. It is a ride. And right from the off, we'll hear the choir singing about a surge. It's a huge super chord. And I think it's going to go right up to the acoustic domes in the Albert Hall and hopefully come crashing through the TV set as well. <laughs> Is it a special piece, do you think, Andrew, when you look at Vaughan Williams' whole output? I think it is, because uh, A, it took him so long to write, and it was his first large-scale uh, major work. He wrote it over the course of seven years. 
and made a huge number of sketches, experimenting, trying, going one way and another. Um, and I think one thing that he really latched onto was the poet Whitman's uh, theme of exploration. And it was something that he was exploring in his own compositional voice as well. He was trying to find his own voice during that period. So I think it's a tremendously important work. Setting text by, by Walt Whitman. Why, did, why couldn't Vaughan Williams um, find an English poet? Why it's an American? A, it's a good question. I mean, of course, he did set English poets. But I think one thing about Whitman was that he was very popular in England at that time. In fact, more so than in America, where he tended to be regarded, he wrote explicit poetry, and tended to be, be, be regarded a bit as a man in a mat. And in this country, he was very popular. And he wrote wild, unrestrained, liberated, democratic poetry, full of adventure, full of exploration. And for Vaughan Williams, who, you have to remember, was trying to forge his own voice, was trying to move away from the, the continental voices, move from under the shadow of Brahms and, and, and Wagner, for example. Here was a fresh new voice that he could turn to, not from this country, but still a fresh new voice, which could give meaning to uh, the sensibility that he wanted to have in his music. And another thing that was preoccupying uh, Vaughan Williams at this time is folk songs. I mean, this is kind of coinciding with the time that he actually started going around England collecting folk songs, doesn't he? And he uses a couple of folk songs in this, a couple of sea shanties, I think. He does use sea shanties. And, that, uh, I mean, that was a, a major influence in his, in his life. And he spent a lot of the time around uh, when the Sea Symphony was written collecting folk songs, as did uh, his friend Holst and Percy Granger and other composers at the time. And they were trying to rediscover some kind of English root. Again, it was about finding their own voice, finding an English voice, and moving perhaps away from the German-Austrian tradition. Still fashionable to James, James do you think, amongst, um, amongst I think, the young? I think he's a guilty <laughs> pleasure. I think people don't know if they're really allowed to like Vaughan Williams, because everyone says he's, you know, he's pastoral, and, and some people think that means pastoral, that his music is out to pasture, it's all buttercups and, and butterflies. But in this work tonight, we're going to hear the last movement, The Explorers. It's this incredible metaphysical kind of contemplation of time and space and death, and that's not the sort of daisies and dandelions we sort of are told Vaughan Williams is all about at all. Mm. And he never parted company with this symphony, did he? He liked it all the way throughout his life. He just, you know. He, he, he said later on in his life, I'm glad it's withstood the ravages of time. I'm rather fond of it. Yeah. So now joining the players of the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra are the 286 singers of the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Chorus and the Chester Festival Chorus. And then tonight's soloists are the soprano Janice Watson, the American baritone Dwayne Croft, and the conductor Gerald Schwartz to perform a sea symphony by Ray Vaughan Williams.
Hey! <laughs> 